Dear friends, welcome back to the ongoing discussion on still photography for the press as part of the ongoing course in journalism and mass communication. In the previous lecture, we had talked about the important dates in the evolution of photography, the special field of press photography and the introductory aspects associated with this field, <coughs> including composition, content, form and ethics. Before moving further to understand how press photography is a challenge every day, we take a look at cameras, the basic tool of a press photographer. As we have learned in an earlier lecture, film cameras held sway over the world of photography till as late as the 1980s and in the last one decade or more, digital cameras have swamped the market, so much so that most manufacturing companies have stopped making film cameras. So most press photographers in business today had learned and practiced their craft with film cameras. So let us have a look at film cameras first. <coughs> Taking a picture is basically a very simple process. There are really two essentials, a device for projecting the image that is the lens and a device for recording or capturing the image on a surface that is the film. There can be any box that is light proof or light tight except for a hole at one end in which a lens is mounted. Then place a ground or opal glass at the other end and you have a camera. This contraption was known as the camera obscura of the 16th century. Now add at the opposite end the lens, a device to hold a film and you have essentially the box camera that evolved later. The box camera with its few refinements such as a viewfinder to make it easy to aim the camera at a subject which was to be photographed, a shutter to make it easy to let the light travel through the lens for a predetermined amount of time and compact looks. Now it becomes a very efficient device that is a very handy camera. In early years when film cameras started becoming common, press photographers needed a camera of greater versatility that means camera which could accept a film of a number of different types and kinds which could be quickly and accurately focused for anything from close-ups to extreme distance shots, a camera which could take lenses with diaphragms adjustable over a wide range of distance, a camera which could have shutter speeds from one second up to at least one upon four hundredth of a second, a camera which could be accurately and conveniently synchronized with a flashlight and of course a camera which could if possible accept a number of different lenses. So now if all these qualities were put in a camera it was the ideal device for at least the press photographers who always needed something to take photographs on the move. The film thus exposed had to be developed in a dark room using specific chemicals. Then the photograph had to be enlarged and printed for approval from the editor or the photo editor and then it was to be given to the process department for further processing like plate making. Just as there is no universal camera, a camera that is all things to all cameramen, so there was no universal press camera. The cameras most frequently used in press photography in that time can be divided into three basic types 
based on the sizes of the negative film they normally produced. So the three kinds of cameras were the 4 into 5 camera, the 120 camera and finally the 35 mm camera. Big cameras were standard in news photography during the early decades of the 20th century. A favorite was the camera model known as Graflex, first offered in two sizes in the year 1902. One producing a 4 inch by 5 inch negative and the other a bigger camera producing a 5 inch to 7 inches of negative. From 1907 to 1923, the press Graflex, a 5 into 7 camera, was the most widely used in news work all over the West and in other countries. This camera used glass plates but could also use a sheet or cut film which was introduced around the year 1915. The speed graphic camera, somewhat more versatile and more convenient to operate, was introduced in the year 1912 and it eventually succeeded the Graflex as the camera carried by most newspaper photographers. Both cameras were products of an American company, the Graflex Incorporated. But early in the 1920s, a new kind of camera appeared which was to have a profound influence on news photography. Designs were perfected for small compact cameras that could easily be held in the palm of one hand and lenses were produced for these so-called miniature or very often termed candid cameras with a greatly increased light gathering power. Using one of these cameras fitted with a fast lens, a photographer could operate inconspicuously and in unfavorable light. In fact, in earlier years, the press photographers could be recognized from a far distance because they carried those big cameras with big lenses and big boxes and later on, when these small candid cameras appeared on the scene, one couldn't make out when a photograph was taken and from where. So we now arrive at a stage when the 35 mm cara cameras had started becoming popular. The 35 mm or a miniature camera actually looks like a toy alongside the massive 4 into 5 of the early eras. It is true that large number of newspaper photographers have turned to the 35mm only after the 1940s or only after the Second World War. But some photojournalists, particularly those in the magazine field, we are using this camera a decade or even two decades earlier. Around 1930, newspaper photographers experimented with the 35mm, attracted by its ability to produce negatives under difficult lighting conditions. But three factors worked against the 35mm camera. Number one, the grain that appeared in enlargements, the impracticability of fast proce processing of the film to meet deadlines and the introduction of the flash bulb which seemed to obviate the need for fast lenses. Since the Second World War, newspapers turned to the 35mm because the speed processing had by then become practical with film and developers that kept grain well within acceptable limits. In addition, faster films and a desire for realism had to a considerable extent deposed the flash bulb and the electronic flash. The first 35mm camera was the German made Leica brand introduced at 
the Leipzig Technology Fair in 1925. It was originally designed as a still camera for testing 35mm movie films. Since then, 35mm cameras have become commonplace. For newspaper work, a 35mm with interchangeable lenses became a must everywhere. The 35mm camera may also be termed as a reflex camera. So the photographer focuses and uses the viewfinder directly through the lens itself or it may be a coupled range finder design with the lens focusing automatically as the range finder is operated. A wide range of black and white and color film materials was soon available in the 35mm size and it soon became most economical of all especially on a per picture basis. The number of exposures on a 35mm film ranged from 20 to 36 per roll at the maximum. In fact, this number was as much as three times as available to somebody who was using a 120 camera. The 35mm also offered the fastest lenses available and thus the greatest chances for success with poor light when the flash was prohibited or it was undesirable. And the 35mm also offered flexibility through many accessories such as interchangeable lenses ranging from 21mm that is extremely wide angle to 1000mm that is extreme telephoto. We will explain these terms later. The normal lens that is the 50mm of the 35 camera gave a tremendous depth of field. It could handle routine news assignments, informal portraits, fast action sports, society reporting and fashion news as well. In the film era, it was as important for press photographers to know the camera as it was to know the capabilities and limitations of films, paper and chemicals. For professional photographers, darkroom experience was a must even though they might turn their film over to a specialist for processing, but they needed to know the technicalities. Of the whole radiation spectrum, our eyes are sensitive to only that small part we call light, ranging from blue, the shortest wavelength of the visible spectrum, through increasing wavelengths to the red color. <coughs> we cannot see cosmic rays, gamma rays, x-rays, ultraviolet rays or infrared rays or heat rays or the waves used in radio broadcasting which fall beyond the visible range of the light spectrum. The silver bromide crystal normally has an even more limited sensitivity, absorbing only the blues at the short wavelength of the visible spectrum plus the invisible ultraviolet rays. This is apparently because the shorter wavelengths have greater frequency and thus greater energy. So the chemical films which were used in the film rolls were basically compounds containing silver bromide and refinements were introduced over a period of time to make the film faster means they could absorb lights at a much faster speed of time and in a much lesser amount of light. So, there is this short uh, thing about film developing. Film developing meant using the right amount of chemicals that is the silver bromide combinations and water for the right time for developing the negative print into a positive image. The three major factors in film development with which the photographers had to be familiar included contrast, grain and density. 
important factors in developing film were temperature time and the degree of agitation with which the pan containing the film under development liquid chemicals water and um, another range of uh, chemicals were mixed and it was shaken or agitated so that the impression on the negative turned into positive all this work was done in a dark room with a very faint red light being available for the operator to see what he was doing because the red light did not get registered on the film which was being developed so <clears throat> now we have a look at the camera components <clears throat> the first essential in photography as we just understood is formation of an image and in truth an image can be formed without a lens also the lens in fact collects a bundle of light rays coming from a single point source redirects them by refraction so they come back together at a new point on the film thus giving us both greater light gathering power and a sharper image lenses are actually so designed that light rays originating at a single point will be refracted just the right amount to bring them back to a single point behind the lens at the film if we have focused correctly so a lens basically captures those images that are coming from outside and transfers them onto a surface where the film is already mounted and the image is captured on that chemical coated film one important thing in fact the first important thing to be learned when we are talking about lenses is focal length what is focal length when we focus a camera we change the distance between the lens and film until all the light rays intercepted by the lens from a given point on the subject converge again on the surface of the film as the subject moves closer to the lens the distance between the lens and the film must be extended as the subject moves away from the lens the distance between the lens and the film must be decreased if we are to stay in focus but as the subject continues to move away we find that we reach a point where further contraction of the lens film distance is no longer needed at that point the lens is set at its principal focus so in effect we have already focused the lens at infinity because the distance cannot be measured any longer at this point the distance from the lens to the film that is the focal plane is the same as the focal length of the lens this distance will vary greatly between different lenses but will never change for any given lens for a single lens the focal length is actually not the distance from the front or rear of the lens to the film plane but from an imaginary point called a node that is usually but not always near the physical center of the lens the focal lengths of lenses are mentioned on the camera in figures such as 7 upon 4.7 or 135 mm or 1 is to 35 f is equal to 75 mm the first in these figures is a lens with a maximum aperture that is the size of the hole of 4.7 and a focal length of 135 mm the second figure would be one with a maximum aperture of 3.5 and a focal length of 75 mm you can find these small figures written on the front of the camera around the lens in every case 
The next point to, re to be remembered after we understand what a lens is all about is the angle of view. Camera lenses are often classified roughly into three categories that is short focal length lenses, normal or standard focal length and long focal length or telephoto lenses. News photographers frequently use cameras fitted with lenses which are short that is less than normal in focal length. Short focal length lenses are usually referred to as wide angle lenses just as the long focal lengths are often given the name telephoto lenses. So this is how we come to the point when interchangeable lenses started being used. It was in 1959 when two German firms Voigtlander and Zumar announced the result of a joint project to manufacture a variable focal length lens for 35 mm still cameras of the single lens reflex design. This was known as the zoom lens and this zoom lens continues to be used throughout the world by all kinds of photographers even today. So first we come to the wide angle lens. The wide angle lens is a short focal length lens that is a length with a, a lens with a focal length shorter than the diagonal of the negative it is designed to cover. Its advantages are that it sees more at less distance and offers increased depth of field at any given lens aperture. The most frequently used wide angle lens with 35 mm cameras is the one with a 35 mm focal length. The second is the long focal length lens. The most commonly used so called tele lenses in the 35 mm field are those with focal lengths ranging from 75 mm to 135 mm. But the longer the focal length, the bigger, the clumsier and the heavier become the lenses beyond the 135 mm range. And these lenses generally cannot be focused with the coupled range finder. With the really long lenses, the photographer will usually find it advisable to use a tripod to hold the camera steady. Now you must be recalling the sports photographers and the specialist photographers with their cameras and the long lenses fitted in front of them. These are actually the telephoto lenses. So after this brief introduction to what lens is all about, we come to the next point that is the aperture. To control the incoming amount of light and its exposure onto the film, we must control the light which strikes the film. One way in which we can control the light is by varying its intensity at the film plane. The relative aperture is marked as numbers on the camera as a guide to setting the aperture that is the diameter of the diaphragm to control the amount that is the intensity of light which actually reaches the film. So we come to the basic the basic object which is being treated by the camera that is light. Light it is something which the photographer must have and light is something the photographer must control. He must control light to achieve the correct exposure, to create a properly defined image and to capture the proper mood and composition. <coughs> there are four basic kinds of outdoor light under which the, a photographer has to function. Number one, front lighting. In this case, the sun is behind the photographer and the result is 
flat illumination on the subject in the front of the photographer shadows are cast away from the camera these are often hidden behind the subject the light works against our attempts to create an illusion of volume space or depth because it is flat and a variation of front lighting is what might be called top lighting that is the light at high noon around midday it is generally to be avoided whenever possible unless our purpose is to create a mood of lassitude the siesta atmosphere of a hot summer day <coughs> number 2 side lighting <coughs> this kind of light is generally unspectacular but very reliable it is of great help in emphasizing shape volume and texture of the subject being captured it gives us a chance to utilize interesting shadow patterns in composition and in the extreme with the light being very low it can actually produce dramatic effects number 3 back lighting here the sun is more or less behind the subject and this is the most dramatic type of lighting and it offers maximum opportunity for depicting some kind of an intangible mood a sense of mystery and a sense of surprise and therefore it is also the most difficult to be used successfully because the photographer can find it difficult to avoid the source of light that is in front of him and the subject has to hide the source of light and the trick is to ensure that the subject itself does not become dark number 4 diffused lighting this form of lighting lacks one strongly centralized source of light it is soft and low in contrast in outdoors it occurs on overcast or cloudy days in the shade or just before dawn and after sunset generally it is considered to be a good form of lighting for close ups and portraits then we come to having artificial light that is lighting with flash Invention of the flash bulb in 1929 revolutionized press photography. It meant that the photographer could carry his own light with him anywhere and it gave him a control that meant greater assurance of getting the right picture anywhere anytime. The flash bulb actually succeeded the magnesium flare and the flash pan. with the magnesium flare that was used in earlier days it was a sort of a blow gun in which the photographer blew through a hose connected to the handle of a meta torch the lung generated air pressure forced the magnesium powder into kerosene or alcohol flame and the result was actually a miniature volcano of light which provided enough light to take a picture if the photographer could remember to open the shutter and pull the dark light the flash pan was a slight improvement a powdered mixture of magnesium potassium chlorate and antimony sulfide was sprinkled along the length of a narrow pan which the photographer held over his head a spark set off the powder to give an explosive flash and a more pleasing and diffused light than the earlier flare but the flash pan as you can understand was about as dangerous as the magnesium flare and as difficult to control a number of photographers were seriously injured some losing their hands in flash powder explosions and in due course of time it led to a ban on the use of powder 
by some newspapers. A company of Germany known as Johannes Ostermeyer experimented with putting thin aluminium foil and oxygen in a glass bulb with a small screw base to fit flashlight bulbs. The photographer now had his light under control, usually unless the bulb exploded. Improvements quickly followed and flash bulbs over a period of time became smaller, more efficient, less likely to explode and ways were found to synchronize the flash with the opening of the shutter and to integrate the flash and the camera in one compact unit. Then less than 10 years after the introduction of the flash bulb came the electronic flash for photography developed around the year 1937 by Harold Edgerton of the Massachusetts Institute of Technology in the US. This great development freed the photographer from the burden of carrying a supply of expendable flash bulbs wherever they went and gave him a light of such brief duration that he could stop a bullet in mid-flight. Later, electronic flash was designed and is now integrated into the camera mechanism itself. Another important component of the camera of earlier years is the filters. In fact, three useful filters are especially used in press photography, the medium yellow filter, the orange filter and the light green filter. The yellow filter darkens and dramatizes a blue sky, builds approximately correct contrast between white clouds and blue sky, and also minimizes skin blemishes in portraits. The orange filter darkens a blue sky even more, gives dramatic sky cloud contrast, and will cut through smoke but not haze to a noticeable degree. A green filter on the other hand is excellent for many scenic shots, increasing the foliage detail, darkening the blue sky and at the same time giving a good rendition of skin tones. So as uh, we understand, the lens, the aperture, the flashlight and the filters were the basic components of the film camera with which every press photographer had to be uh, properly educated and they also had to know how a film was developed, printed, enlarged and finally given for printing. This continued throughout the period when film cameras were used and then it was the era of the digital camera. Digital photography has many advantages over traditional film photography. Digital photographs are convenient, allow you to see the results instantly, do not require the costs of film rolls and developing and are suitable for software editing and uploading to the internet and transmitted from one place to the other with the use of a computer or a mobile phone instantly. While shooting on film will always have a place in the world of photography, digital camera models have taken over the consumer market almost completely. Just five years ago, buying a digital camera in India that could take photos of the same visual qualities as a film camera would cost more than rupees 30,000 or 40,000. But since then prices have dropped tremendously and the camera quality has increased. Today non-professional cameras in the range of 10,000 rupees or around it are nearly of professional quality and all but the cheapest digital cameras produced very decent looking images which can be printed, uploaded published on the internet 
and sent or transmitted anywhere without their quality getting any worse. There are many additional features available on digital cameras including image stabilization, onboard image editing, image recognition, facial feature recognition, color correction functions, auto bracketing and burst modes. A lot of these can be handled by image editing software and so they can be unnecessary and often inferior when built into a camera. The burst mode, the macro mode and image stabilization are probably the most useful extra features. But the best way to find out which camera is best for you is to explore any of the numerous digital photography websites and magazines that offer comparisons and user reviews of hundreds of different cameras today. So for anyone wishing to venture into the field of press photography or any kind of photography today, the digital cameras are the best option to go for. In any case, the film cameras are hardly used anywhere and the facility for developing and printing the film roll is becoming rarer in most cities. There is something called the megapixel ratings in the case of digital cameras. Let's see what this is all about. The basic attribute of a digital camera that determines image quality is its megapixel rating. This number refers to the amount of information that the camera sensor can capture in a single photograph. Cameras with high megapixel ratings like 12 or so, 10, 12 or so, take larger pictures with more detail. These photos will also look better when printed, especially in bigger sizes. In fact, at the range of 5 megapixels, the image quality gets closer to what a good film camera would have given you. If somebody is willing to spend 5000 or nearly the same amount on a digital camera, then it is difficult to find a model that does not have 5 megapixels. It will have at least 5. These cameras are fine for most people who just want to take some family photographs or capture vacation memories. The more you spend, the more megapixels you get. In the range of 20 to 30,000 rupees, one can expect to find cameras with anywhere from 8 to 12 megapixels. If one plans to take artistic photographs, serious photographs, sell prints of the photographs thus made, or post large high resolution photographs on the internet, this is the range to be used. If you think you need a more powerful camera than that, you probably can get them and you probably don't need this information here. You will know what you want. The next point to be understood for all kinds of cameras is the shutter speed. Shutter speed is the amount of time the shutter remains open to allow light through it. An extremely fast shutter speed is 1 upon 2000th part of a second. While camera settings usually allow up to about 1 second which is very slow. 1 60th of a second is about as slow a shutter speed as you can use when taking a handheld shot and you will not get any blur. Some photographers force their camera shutters to stay open for much longer to create various special effects. Leaving a camera pointed at the night sky with the shutter open for several hours can result in a photo of the paths of the stars that they seem to take across the sky as the earth rotates. Practice and experience are the best ways to figure out which combinations of aperture and shutter speed are best for different kinds of photographs. 
while a slow shutter speed lets in more light it also makes it very difficult to get a crisp picture any movement at all of either the subject or the camera will result in blurring sometimes you might want this effect but for a clear photo of a moving object you actually need a fast shutter speed many cameras have a semi automatic mode that can be set to either aperture priority or shutter priority you can either set the aperture or shutter speed depending on which priority mode is enabled to the desired setting and the camera calculates the right setting to accommodate the lighting conditions the camera might also have a variety of modes to choose from such as sports mode or outdoor mode or close up mode these are actually aperture and shutter speed presets again experience will let you know what conditions are right for each mode so now we come to the point to ask ourselves how to take good photographs taking photographs with a digital camera follows many of the same techniques that make for successful film camera photographs however the digital cameras differ in a few important ways there is usually a lag between the moment you press the shutter release button and the camera takes the picture where for the most expensive models a longer lag time means that it's more difficult to capture a moment so how can you minimize the problem number 1 set your focus ahead of time when using auto focus pressing the shutter and releasing it halfway tells the camera to focus on in your target you might have to wait for a few seconds with that button halfway down but when you finally take the picture the camera won't have to waste time to focus itself the second trick is to use manual exposure settings it takes time for the camera to calculate exposure settings in a full automatic mode so you have, you could set them manually whenever you can thus the lag will be reduced further next is do not use flash unless it is absolutely necessary the time it takes to charge the flash can create an additional lag if you need a flash consider using an external flash unit so that you can reduce the lag and keep the camera ready immediately for taking a second shot another trick is to use the view finder instead of the lcd screen at the back of the digital camera this will save your batteries and reduce the amount of work that the camera's mechanism has to do another point is to reduce the image quality in fact digital cameras allow you to adjust the size and resolution of the photographs you are taking huge or uncompressed photograph files will look great but they might create a time lag if you are trying to capture action shots try a lower quality setting with smaller images obviously you are sacrificing large high resolution images but it will increase your chances of getting the shot you wanted experiment must be made with the camera settings to find the right balance between image quality and shutter lag another trick is to use the burst mode if your camera offers a burst mode it is a great way to get the precise moment you are shooting for by taking a series of quick photos over the course of a few seconds depending on the camera the burst mode that is a continuous mode it may require a compromise in image quality but it will definitely offer 
a longer choice a greater choice from which the best photograph can be chosen so the next important aspect is choosing a subject press photographers are aware that the world is full of attractive sights and scenes which have only to be discovered and recorded without intervention on the part of anyone the reporter must only fully adapt to the conditions determined by the natural structure of the real world his contribution is that in the given situation which he correctly assesses as quickly as possible he finds the most suitable position providing the most eloquent picture from the viewpoint of communication on the given subject it is expected that he will also attempt to have the picture achieve an aesthetic impact as well these are the main tasks placed on anyone who tries to set down in a truthful and dynamic way to events to which he was a witness press photography actually has a very glamorous image based largely on tv documentaries and films about larger than life paparazzi photographers paparazzi in fact is the italian word which literally means buzzing insects these paparazzi photographers have a job to capture images of celebrities for the national newspapers gossip magazines entertainment magazines and so on largely they are freelancers not employed by any one company and they go about their work wherever possible wherever they can and they try to sell the photographs of candid moments taken from hidden points and many times often invading the privacy of the celebrity and they try to sell those photographs to the highest bidder but the vast majority of press photographers are skillful diplomatic people who work under pressure to capture the best possible images to document events tell a story meet the picture editors deadlines and help in making the image of the newspaper as well as making it successful among the areas they are supposed to cover are court proceedings to business stories inauguration of public facilities such as hospitals and parks city gatherings and those who are experienced enough it could include sports and politics in addition to entertainment and fashion photo journalist often provides words as well as pictures and often suggest the stories themselves and produce photographs that underscore a point made within the text or an editorial opinion rather than simply document a series of events that is why press photographers take pride in being counted as journalists or photo journalists so press photographers produce photographs of current events and the people involved in them on a daily basis for national or local newspapers news magazines and press agencies images are invariably shot on location using handheld digital cameras with a portable electronic flash newspapers and press agencies keep abreast of the upcoming events so a great deal of press photography can be scheduled in advance however publications do organize work in shifts so that photographers are always available and ready to cover any breaking news story the news editor decides which stories are to be covered while the picture editor decides how many images will be required and he briefs the photographers on the type of shots he is looking for the photographer may take a variety of shots but will generally be expected to present four or five usable pictures for each news story 
they are usually under pressure to get from one location to the next and must therefore be organized and efficient. Press photographers working for organizations or local newspapers need to have the ability to make the commonplace or very mundane event appear interesting and therefore one can always hear them talking about looking for a fresh angle to a routine subject. In view of all this, very often the proper setting of a subject does not last long and what is needed therefore is a swift reaction and presence of mind on the part of the photographer. While most photographers certainly recognize the importance of the decisive moment, they do not reject additional changes in the final enlargement or while submitting the final photograph. On the other hand, there could be situations where the photographers have to especially create a subject to be photographed, such as a landscape, a building, a river, garden, flower shows and so on. In such cases, they do not have to hurry. The subject is not going away anywhere or not even moving about and they can pause and ponder as to which angle would be the best. Both methods, the first often referred to as taking photographs and the second referred to as making photographs can produce good results on conditions that the chosen path corresponds to the photographer's inclinations and the character of the subject matter. Quite often, one and the same photographer alternately uses each method according to the way he approaches an assignment. It should be added that there are somewhat exceptional photographers who hold hard and fast to either of the two methods, taking photographs or making photographs. And this choice is tied to their own personal philosophy for the profession. So you cannot fault them either. Press photography for most part belongs to the taking photographs category and we shall confine our discussion to choosing good subjects for news photographs. Words that will describe a good news photograph are actually elusive. Each photographer must interpret news photographs in their own way, adapt them to his own purposes as part of his own individual approach to reporting with a camera. Storytelling is paramount for the photojournalist. All other qualities of a good news photographer must be subordinate or more exactly must be made to contribute to this basic primary purposes of storytelling through a photograph. The storytelling picture develops from less concern about the grains in the emulsion and more concern about the grains of interest in the subject in front. So the first point to, remember, to be remembered while choosing a photograph is the meaning in a news photograph. The photographer must begin with a mental point of view, a story approach born of interest in the subject because an interested photographer is a photographer with knowledge and understanding of the subject. The reporter working with either a typewriter or a camera is qualified to write a story or make a visual statement about an event only if he understands it and understanding is rarely born out of a cynical point of view. The photographer therefore should be able to feel the emotion involved in the subject but at the same time remain an observer with a camera searching for meanings around him. This does not represent a betrayal of the journalistic tradition of objectivity but rather it represents a search for meaning through expression of a point of view based on knowledge. The print can have something to say only if the photographer approaches the subject from what seems to him a truthful point of view. 
one of the major advantages of photography is that it is a universal language and the fact that it gives the viewer a feeling that he is getting a glimpse of reality some press photographers are still doing violence to this concept cameras don't lie but photographers can and sometimes they do the cameraman's judgment on point of view perspective posing lighting and timing may often result in a picture that does not conform to reality the cameraman or the photographer often faces that same temptation as the print journalist the temptation to emphasize the dramatic the highlights perhaps the one small moment of open conflict and both are guilty of distortion if they emphasize the sensational rather than the merely significant both can emphasize or play down whatever they please and if they approach the subject with a biased mind or with a determination to search out something sensational the result in all probability will be a distortion or a lie at the same time the technique of candid photography can lead to false reporting unless the cameraman realizes that a fraction of a moment in time does not the represent the whole truth about an event any person in the news can be made to look foolish by the candid photographer lying in wait just for the right moment of an unflattering gesture or expression but it will not be an overall comment on the situation being photographed so meaning is essential in news photography but it must be meaning based on honest reporting and the camera no matter what its automatic features can never be a reporter only the photographer can play this role and the next point to be remembered is the impact a photograph may contain meaning but meaning serves no purpose unless it is communicated the reader must be persuaded to stop turning the pages of his newspapers long enough to look at the photograph this stopping power must be built into the picture through the skills of the photographer impact can be imparted to a photograph in many ways through selection of subject matter through arrangement of the various elements of the picture through perspective or camera angle through lighting correct timing of the shutter release to catch a significant moment and novelty may achieve impact but novelty is justified only if it is relevant the answer lies in the ability to see reality from a viewpoint that the unimaginative may have overlooked most often impact in a photograph comes from animation a still photograph actually can convey a feeling of action if a photographer is skillful enough to time his exposure in such a manner that the resulting photograph conveys a sense of movement that actually preceded and followed the moment the shutter was pressed in fact animation or expressions may also appear in human faces in the emotions mirrored on it or it may appear in still photographs that picture the reaction between individuals looking at each other or between one individual and the situation in which he is depicted human emotions are basic in news reporting of many situations and they can be conveyed by the skillful writer or the skillful photographer the element of unity is the next that is unity of all elements within a photograph having a unity of purpose the shapes lines areas of light and shade must contribute to that purpose inexperienced photographers tend to include too much in a photograph but it is the same like inexperienced writers trying to crowd too much within a single sentence the result is the same in both situations a vagueness and a failure to communicate the photographer 
must reduce his picture to the fewest possible elements that will contain the essential meaning of what he is trying to say. And when distracting elements remain, he must use his technical knowledge to subdue them as much and as far as possible to get a well composed photograph which conveys its message without ambiguity. Composition actually is another word for unity but it must be kept subordinate to meaning in photojournalism. A photograph that exists only for its pleasing arrangement of subject matter has little reason to be used in print, photo print journalism or in a news publication. In news photography, the function of the composition is to support and clarify the meaning. In a posed shot, the subject can be arranged and rearranged almost at will. Inanimate objects used as props to support meaning can be moved about or removed completely. But many photojournalists prefer to intrude upon reality as little as possible. This means a minimum of changes in the subject itself. The photographer then falls back on other devices such as point of view, perspective, contrast and format. In point of view, the matter of concern is the relationship of the foreground, background and the principal subject. Choosing a subject in action or movement related events is actually not much in the control of the photographer. The point is to have a subject that is out of the ordinary yet belongs to an ordinary situation. We will conclude our discussion at this point and in our next discussion we shall take the subject further on choosing a subject for news photography. Till then, thanks and best wishes.